first verse, singing all the work. meet over here, sit out a few chairs, and we're all good to go. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, pray, and then you can be seated. We'll do, the, we'll, we'll do it that way. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and the opportunity to meet in your house. Lord, I pray that you would uh, just give us a good time in our prayer meeting and Bible study. Lord, may we lift you up in song. <clears throat> Lord, may we glorify you in preaching. And uh, Lord, be with us now. we do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. One. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of Thy love. At the impulse of Thy love. Take my feet and let Hey! 
James 1 will be throughout the book of James tonight uh, as we are moving our way through uh, verse by verse, but not in order, and uh, dealing with each topic of James as it arises. Uh, tonight we are continuing the outline from last week, the good, the bad, and the ugly, not the spaghetti western, but the topic of your tongue. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, we looked last week at ten good uses of the tongue. And today we will look at the bad and the ugly as we work our way through here. Three atoms of carbon, five atoms of hydrogen, three atoms of nitrogen, and nine atoms of oxygen. Seems pretty innocuous, right? Um, you know, I've got carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen. Well, we're carbon-based life forms, so carbon's not all that bad, right? Hydrogen and water, oxygen fit together to make water. So hydrogen and oxygen, that's, those, are, those are good things. And nitrogen composes 78% of the air that we breathe, so nitrogen is not that bad, right? But if you take three atoms of carbon, five atoms of hydrogen, three atoms of nitrogen, and nine atoms of oxygen and put them together, who knows what that makes, students? This man knows. Uh, if you're a science head or a student of munitions, you'll know that the makeup I gave you is for a little compound called nitroglycerin. Extremely sensitive to shock and highly explosive, it is the detonating ingredient in dynamite, which has potential to do fantastic damage. It's also highly useful in warfare as it burns without smoke that would block uh, the vision of artillery or gunners. Uh, it was, um, uh, put it this way, one Swedish man with the first name Alfred capitalized on the synthesization of nitroglycerin. Even the death of his brother and others in a factory explosion didn't deter him from building close to 100 factories that produced explosives. These factories supplied munitions to whoever could afford them, sometimes even to opposing armies in the same war. We'll talk about that man later. But for now, I want you to think about the power that dynamite and nitroglycerin yield. Despite their ability to destroy, James chapter 3 talks about something even more destructive. The tongue. And so as we look at uh, five bad uses and three more ugly uses, I'll work our way through here. Um, like I say, if you still have your outline, uh, chapter 1, verse 6, we'll see a mention here, a bad use of the tongue. Uh, chapter 1, verse 6, But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind, and tossed. For let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Uh, a bad use of the tongue is, number one, inconsistent prayer. You say, how could prayer ever be a bad thing if it's inconsistent? Inconsistent prayer says something about what you believe God's character is. If you really believe God would come through, then you would petition Him nonstop, like the widow that Christ mentions in Luke 17's parable. Some call it the parable of the unjust judge. Some call it the parable of the importunate widow. But either way, so she continued to knock and knock and knock until she had her case resolved. And if we pray inconsistently, secretly, we're saying, God, 
I don't want to invest a whole lot of time in this just in case you don't come through. Inconsistent prayer is a bad kind of prayer and a bad use of the time. A second kind we find down in verse 19 in chapter 1. We looked at the beginning of these for a good use of the tongue, but we're going to talk about a bad use here. James 1.19, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. We said that one of the good uses of the tongue was slow speech. So one of the bad uses of the tongue is hasty speech. Hasty speech. The book of, so uh, the book of Proverbs says it this way, he that answereth the matter before he heareth it, it is folly unto him. So when we are hasty in our speech, you know the expression says haste makes waste, and it certainly does with our speech as well. To answer a matter before we hear it, to not hear someone out can cause a great deal of harm. So let's not be hasty with our speech, because what follows haste was right there in the next verse. What follows hasty speech is probably going to be wrath. Uh, the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Um, verse 21 is not specifically mentioning speech necessarily, but it could be. Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Uh, we could talk about filthy talk. Um, naughtiness uh, is a bad use of the tongue as well. But to stick to the outline and to try to stay on pace, uh, we will continue to move through. Number three, uh, chapter two, verse 14. I want to just uh, uh, move over to there. Next few verses don't talk about speech, but chapter two, verse 14 does. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? Uh, now, we have an entire study that will come another time on the topic of faith versus works. Is James saying that you're saved by works and not by faith? That comes in contrast to what Paul says, for by grace you save through faith, but that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. It's not of works. Paul says it's not of works, it's not of works, it's all of faith. Sola fide. All of faith. Well, James has something to say about that. And when he says, can faith save him? The answer, can faith save him? Yes, of course, faith saves. But what the connotation here in this verse is, can that kind of faith save him? And you say, what kind of faith? The kind of faith that we're talking about in point number three, which is talk without walk. Talk without walk. Uh, the basketball court uh, is a primary place to to uh, show that off. Um, I hate a braggart on the court. I hate someone who runs their mouth the whole time. And sometimes they, sometimes they actually can back it up. But I still hate it when they run their mouth. Get on the court. Play your game. Get out there. Show what you can do. And let your talk, excuse me, let your walk talk. And not just your talk talk. Uh, whenever James says this here about let, uh, when he says, what does it profit if a man say he hath faith and hath not works? Uh, it doesn't profit anything. If you have a big profession but no possession, if you have lots to say about, <laughs> you know, I've been in a lot of churches on deputation. I've been a member of several churches. I've been in 200-something churches on deputation. You meet a lot of people. And out of all those people, no doubt some of them have me fooled. But sometimes you can kind of pick up on whether or not a person really professes it or if they just have a big talk. If they talk real big there in church, you know, if they're, if they're real loud and vocal and, and, and boisterous and maybe even braggadocious, and whether they go home and live it. I'd rather you not say a word, go home and live it, than to talk a good game and not live it. I could give lots of examples there, but I want to keep moving because I got some things to get through here. James 4 now, another use of the tongue we find in James 4. Just tore my page a little bit. James 4, verses, first, uh, first three verses there. James says, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? 
You lust and you have not. You kill and you desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not because you ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Another bad use of the tongue. Almost seems like it's in conflict with what I said last week because I said prayer is a good use of the tongue and I gave you the five kinds of prayer and that, that they were good. But I've already mentioned there's one bad use of the tongue. Number one was inconsistent prayer. Number four down here is selfish prayer. Selfish prayer. Prayer that we have that we offer simply for the purpose of lust, desire to have, fighting and warring, asking that you may consume it upon your own lusts. <clears throat> uh, I posed a, a thought um, probably about a year ago about the kinds of prayers that we pray. And so often our prayers, and, and I'm, not, I'm not picking out anybody's prayer request tonight, uh, because I even prayed some things that, uh, that and I, I desire the things that you desire. Uh, so I pray for those things as well. I didn't sit there and secretly analyze and say, oh, well, you know, uh, that Vargas, I really don't care what kind of, you know, I, I think he wants, I think he's having us pray so that he can have things his way. So, uh, look, I, I'm not picking out any of these. But so often, I mean, how many times do we come to the Lord and the motive behind our prayer is, if we boil down all the extracurriculars, hey, God, give me what I want. <laughs> we pray for the chapels tonight. What do we pray for? Well, if they'd have a safe trip, that everything goes smoothly, that they don't have any bumps, that there's no, that there's no uh, hang-ups anywhere, that they, you know, that they don't get taken into custody by, by somebody for breaking some obscure law in one of the far co- You know, we, we want them to have a good trip, a nice trip. We want them to be healthy. We pray for health there. Pray for health for his unborn child. We, you know, these are things that, that make sense for us to pray. But I'm convinced that there's a lot of times that we simply pray ourselves into a life of ease and comfort. And that's what our prayers tend to revolve around. And if we... We're able to put it on a spreadsheet and look at the things that we pray for. That probably about 90% of those would be that God would bless, protect, give health to, give strength to, give money to us and the people that we care about. You're like, well, what else is there to pray for? I mean, that's why that's that's why we got saved, right? Well, I hope that wasn't it, <laughs> right? Well, what should we pray for then? We should pray for God's will to be done. Pray for God's will to be done. I pray that your job situation works out in a way that's favorable for you, but for, for most of all, the Lord's will be done in the matter. Uh, I Christian school teacher for many years and had kids pray, you know, pray, pray that pray that so and so would uh, and I've had some kids with in, in rough backgrounds or their families in rough backgrounds, and they'd say things like, you know, pray that, pray that uh, Pray that my uncle gets out of jail. Well, I don't know that I want your uncle to get out of jail. <laughs> let, let, let's, let's, uh, well, let's understand what did he do? Is he guilty? And does he need to serve the time? Will that rehabilitate him? But, you know, I'd hear all kinds of, all kinds of requests. And so, you know, a lot of times I just kind of, tra- I just kind of, kind of quietly transform it into, you know, uh, and Father, we pray for Christina's uncle that your will be done in his, his detention situation, you know. And, uh, you know, because... Uh, maybe that's not the. Uh, I, I'm convinced sometimes that we. So let me back up a second. Put it this way. Many times God will put someone into a situation. Even a lost person will put them into a situation to cause their hearts to be tender and to bring them to conviction to bring them salvation. And a lot of times we as Christians, if we had our way we will pray them out of the situation that God is using to bring them to Him. And instead, when you think, say, Lord, your will be done. If it be your will, would you heal them of this? Or would you get them through this tough time? Or would you cause, you know, whatever to, to be? But instead, Lord, if they're not saved, would you use this situation to bring them to you? And then down the line, secondary to everything else, secondary to, to you bringing them to you in salvation, Lord, work out the rest of the details. So uh, a selfish prayer sometimes. Selfish prayer is bad. Uh, Number five, bad use of the tongue. 
chapter 4, verse 11 says, Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother, speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judges another? Uh, the fifth bad use of the tongue is a condemnation of a brother. Condemnation of a brother. Uh, we dealt last week for a few minutes with the topic of, of, of criticism and gossip. That's judgment of a, of a brother. Condemnation. This passage is not uh, using those famous words that every lost person knows from Matthew 7. 1. Judge not. Judge, it's not saying that you can't make a discernment about things, but what it's saying there is, uh, is a condemnation of a brother when it says thou judge uh, his brother. It's condemning them. Uh, what are reasons we shouldn't judge a brother? Well, instead we can use that same energy to pray for the brother. Another reason we shouldn't judge a brother is, have you ever considered you might not have all the facts? We judge a situation on its surface and we just say, well, if that was me, I would whatever else. And you don't have no idea the other things that are going on, the other things, the other things in play. So don't condemn a brother. Uh, with that, the uh, notes say turn over to chapter 5, 19 and 20, which we did deal with under a positive use of the tongue. And if we contrast 4, 11 and 12, which says don't judge your brother, don't criticize your brother. Yet on the other side of it, in Matthew 5, 19, if any of you do err from the truth and will convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save us all from death, shall hide a multitude of sins. Instead of being a judge of your brother, again, I'm going to put this in a legal kind of structure. The Bible says don't be a judge. Instead of being a judge of your brother, be an advocate for him. Be a lawyer for him. Go to him. Go to the throne of grace and intercede for him. No condemnation of a brother. I'm on pace to keep I'm, I'm on good pace. Ugly uses of the time. One, two, and three. We've got three ugly uses, and then what are we going to do about these things? An ugly use of the tongue. Chapter three is the main source of, of the instruction on the tongue. It has the most consecutive verses that deal with uh, bad uses of the tongue. And let's just begin to look here in uh, James three, verse two. James three, two says this, For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Think about that. How many times have you messed up with your mouth? Well, probably more than once. <laughs> uh, I, I know that I sure have. And when I think of all the things in my life that I regret, just about all of them involve the use of my tongue. Oh, there's different chances and opportunities I've had that I didn't take, uh, different things that I wish I would have done, and, and I sort of regret those. But for the most part, it has to do with in a moment of stupidity or in a moment of haste or in a moment of anger, I said something that I later regretted, and it's sad, it's out there, you squeeze the cheaper toothpaste, there's no putting it back in, and it's there. Um, that's what verse 2 is saying there. If you find somebody who can control his tongue, he's able to control his whole body. If I could eliminate from my life the times that I have done things with my mouth that I regret, that would be most of the things I regret. Uh, maybe, maybe yours is a different story, but that's I can say that about myself. Uh, verse 3 now. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. You put the bit in the mouth, and you can control her head, and you control her head, and you can control uh, you can control uh, the whole body on a horse. Matter of fact, the same concept works with a human too, and and like wrestling around with others. Have you ever like taken your finger and hooked in their jaw like that? You ever done that? Get behind them and hook in their jaw. You just turn that head. And that's it. They can't fight you. You get behind them. And you just sit there. You make them look like a like a marionette. You know, they're just turning their head wherever because you got them hooked in. If you've never done that, you. You need to sometime. It's a lot of fun. Um, parents with kids, I mean, you can get around behind them. They won't even know what hit them. Uh, <clears throat> don't try it with somebody bigger than you or, or somebody who's aware it's happening because they might bite your finger off. Um, anyway, uh, behold also the ships 
which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things of the sea is, is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think James makes a big deal of the tongue. I mean, is it is it justified or is it? James is kind of out there a little bit. No, I think he's on the mark. <laughs> uh, the ugly uses of the tongue, number one, is destruction. Uh, we saw in verses 5 and 6, it talks about how great a matter a little fire, a little fire kindled. A little fire. When, when I was little, there were wild, wildfires out in California. I didn't know anything about it. But nowadays, you see them all the time. I mean, it, it's like, you know... Um, Many times, Tammy is my source of, of news or Facebook if it's not her. And it's like, did you hear about the wildfires in California? I was like, look, tell me when there's not a wildfire in California. That will be news. Um, but we've been in um, we've been in Colorado uh, on deputation, and not far from where we were, um, huge wildfires and the interstate was closed. And part of that, as I sat in the parking lot and talked to the pastor, the fires were taking place probably 30 miles away. And as I'm talking to him, I see ash landing on me from the fire on the mountain 30 miles away. And it's like, that's, that's a little close. Um, and how did it start? A little fire. Probably somebody throwing a cigarette out or failing to um, completely extinguish a campfire. Just a little fire. Great destruction. Uh, Ephesians 2, I meant to have these printed out somewhere already. Uh, Ephesians 2 has a lot to say about the tongue as well. I'm just going to hit the verses that are here on the outline. Ephesians 2, verse 22. That you put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, verse 25. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Uh, verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. Uh, verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away with, from you with all malice. All these are dis destruction. Great fire. Ephesians uh, 5. Here are some uses of the tongue. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness. You're like, how is that? Wait a minute, how is that? A sin of the time. Listen. Fornication, uncleanness, and covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. Which means, one, don't let that sin in the camp. And secondly, that should, that should be something that we're not discussing. Uh, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. We shouldn't be talking about those things. We shouldn't be filling our mind with those things. They cause destruction. Number two, ugly use of the tongue. The tongue is an uncontrolled poison. Verse 7 and 8 laid that out. For every kind of beast, of bird, serpents, all that stuff has been tamed in one, one way or another. You say, wait a minute, how have they been tamed? Go to the zoo. How do those elephants get in there? And tigers and lions and snakes, how do they get in there? Do they walk up or slither up and like, uh, excuse me, Mr. Zookeeper, uh, I would like to apply for residence in your zoo. Of course not. How'd they get there? They got there because mankind subdued them and put them behind plexiglass or in cages or in netting for birds. Uh, everything has been tamed by man, but not the tongue. And what does it say about the tongue? The tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. And the little call-out box to the right of that in your notes there, I got a little call-out, and it says this. Uh, I've got a couple of blanks in it. It says, the damage done by an unbridled tongue is first and foremost to its user. I'll say that again. The damage done, done by an unbridled tongue is first and foremost to its user. 
um, you are damaging and poisoning yourself whenever you have ugly uses of the tongue. It, it's true. I mentioned already that gossip hurts three people. It hurts the person that's being gossiped about. It hurts the person who is hearing these things because it damages the testimony of that brother. And it hurts the person who's doing the gossiping. Uh, it's, uh, it is dangerous. It is destructive. It's a fire that consumes and destroys everybody and everything. Uh, chapter 3 now, verse 9. Chapter 3, verse 9. Uh, I was on the right page already. Uh, the last blank there, the third blank under ugly, is double talk. Double talk. Uh, verse 9, Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Does the fountain send forth in the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries? Can a vine produce figs? Especially if you think, you know, you're thinking a fig comes off a tree. What does a vine produce? It produces grapes. It produces other kinds of uh, berries. It produces watermelon. It's not going to make a fig. So can no fountain both yield salt, water, and fresh. If, let's just say we went to your, your place of work. And I know where just about everybody works because it's, it's either there or it's there. And there was a water fountain there. And you drank from it one day. And nothing was out of the ordinary. And you drank from it the next day, and it had an awful, sour, bitter taste. Well, what would you do? You, you, you probably wouldn't say, oh, it's probably just my taste buds out of whack. I'm not going to worry about it. You'd probably say, hey, I need to, we need to report this to somebody. You tell your supervisor. You tell your CEO. You, tell, you, you say, hey, look, there's an issue with this water fountain. This water may not even be safe to drink. But now let's, let's imagine this. So Monday, you drink it, it's fine. Tuesday, it's bad. Wednesday, you taste it again, it's fine. You're like, well, hey, I guess my complaint went somewhere. You know, they took care of it. It's all good. And you go back Thursday and it's bitter again. You'd be like, look, I don't know what kind of games y'all are playing, but this water fountain needs to be taken out of commission completely. Replace this junk because this is not the way it's supposed to be. Whenever... We come to church and we sing and we're all go and then and then we go off on Monday and we use our time for distractive reasons. The Bible says this ought not so to be. Who remembers the uh, crisis uh, with the uh, uh, with the water in Flint, Michigan? Remember that a few years back. India wasn't. India, India doesn't. Sorry. Um, anyway, the water there contained um, contained uh, like seven times as much lead as is allowable by law and was toxic. There were uh, 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 87 contracted Legionnaire's disease. 12 died from it. It affects children uh, more than adults. Um, there was a big uh, settlement out of it. People got paid. Uh, many people that had lost their, their children. Um, it was a big, a big issue. How did the water in Flint, Michigan get bad all of a sudden? And what makes it good now? Well, the city had been in agreement. Uh, they, had, they had been under a long-term agreement to get water from, um, I forget the exact acronym, but they were getting water from the Great Lakes uh, that was being pumped into them. The city was looking, uh, it wasn't just Flint, but also Detroit at large. We're looking at ways to cut back. They said, we got to save some money. The contract that we're getting water from them cost us too much. So we have to take cost-saving cost measures. And so they said, here's what we'll do. We'll get some quotes, and they outsource. And they said, well, instead of, getting, uh, instead of getting water from the Great Lakes, we'll get water from the Flint River. And so over a period of time, 2012 to 2013, they changed over, and they got their water from a different source. And then what happens? Well, people began filling cups and bottles of stuff, and it looked like they had dipped it out of a mud puddle. And this went on for a number of years until the governor stepped in and then actually even the federal government stepped in and said, there's a big problem here. And then they switched back the source of their water to the Great Lakes. And guess what? Everything's good again. 
the water from Great Lakes was good, the water from Flint River, and the sources, actually the problem wasn't exactly the river, the problem was with the pipes, uh, the lead pipes that, that led from, um, old, old pipe that led from the Flint River into the source that they need to distribute. Well, everything is good now. So the government tells us. But everything's supposed to be good. And I trust that it is good. Why? Because the water comes from a different source and it came from during the bad times. Well, the source is the problem, which gets me right here to the remedy for the bad and ugly. I have three things under that. What is the fix to this whole issue of the tongue? Um, if there's anybody that's never had a problem with their tongue ever, raise your hand. I want to see you. I want to see you real fast. All right. So we, we all have an issue here. We all have a tongue and we've all said things that we shouldn't have. Um, and chances are we probably will get. But how can we do it less? How can we get it more under control and have fewer outbreaks in the future? Uh, number one, go to the wellspring. Uh, verses 11 and 12, we talked about, does a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? No, it does not. So the issue is, first of all, we need to go to the wellspring. We need to go to the source of the water. Uh, Matthew 12, verses 34 through 37, Jesus uh, uses a parable that I'm going to summarize the same way that he did. It's not that which go. It's not that which goes into a man that defiles him. It's that which comes out of him. So the thing that we have to do, and, and this is this is how we fix any sin, by the way. So this is a nice little blueprint for any sin that we're dealing with. First of all, we need to get to the source of it. You don't say, well. <laughs> Well, you know what? I just keep, and, and I've seen people do this. I've seen, I've seen kids do this. Coach basketball and had kids who had trouble controlling their tempers or controlling their mouth. And so they'd say, that's it. I'm just putting a zip on my lip and I won't say anything else all day. You're like, oh, okay, well, then they won't have any more sin. No, you still didn't go to the source. You still didn't fix the root of the problem. You only fixed where the water came out. You didn't fix the source of the water. Go to the source. Go to the wellspring. And the wellspring is the heart. Out of the heart proceeds. Um, actually, we have a couple of verses that says, but the one in Proverbs says, out of the heart proceeds all the issues of life. Uh, there's another verse here in Galatians that says, out of the heart pr proceeds all sorts of wickedness. Well, all sorts of wickedness doesn't have to proceed, but we have to acknowledge that the source of the problem is our own heart. Let me say that again. The source of the problem is our own heart. I'm going to say that one more time and you understand. The source of the problem is our own heart. Because so many times we want to try to put the finger on somebody else. Well, I wouldn't have a problem with my mouth if so-and-so didn't instigate me. If the people in my work didn't make me so furious that then I just have to lash out and have to say whatever. Well, if, you know, you got, you got kids and they have brothers and sisters. I would do just fine if my brother didn't irritate me or my sister didn't irritate me or one of my parents didn't irritate me or whatever. I'd be, I'd, be, uh, I'd be just fine if everybody would just leave me alone. Well, you wouldn't because the source of the problem is your heart. Because there's always going to be other people in the world that you're going to have to deal with. So we have to acknowledge the root of the problem is me. But, but what about other people? No, just no. The root of the problem goes right here. Go to the wellspring. Number two. Number two, how do we fix the problem? We fix it by what we see over here in James chapter 4, verse 6. Uh, and the blank, what goes in the blank is this. And I mean this with all reverence. I'm not meaning it as, as some lighthearted statement. Have a come to Jesus moment. All right, now, that's a, in the States, that's a euphemism of, hey, we're going to have a come to Jesus moment. You say that to your kids. Hey, we're going to have a come to Jesus moment. And that means that that the, uh, the, uh, the rod of knowledge is going to be applied to the seat of education. All right. That's why, but, but what I'm saying here is a true come to Jesus. Look, what does it say here? Verse six. But he gave more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resists the proud, and give, but giveth grace to the humble. And you are proud if you blame your problem on everybody else. God says, all right, then 
You just sit there and not get any help. But if you're willing to admit that you're the problem, then you can get help. Verse 7, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Have a true come to Jesus moment. Come to him and say, Lord, I am the problem. I have a sinful nature. I am not allowing you to control my mouth and my decisions and my actions. I am to blame. I repent. I turn. I humble myself. I submit myself to you. And then you'll see something good happen. And number three, um, we got to go back to chapter three for a second here. I'm going to read a verse that sounds counter to what I'm about to say, but you'll understand it when I'm done. Chapter three, verse eight said this, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. You're like, oh, no man can tame it. It's hopeless. No, nobody can do this. Pastor Scott, you're asking me to do something that nobody has ever done in the history of the world. This is, it's completely foolish for me to even try because it says no man can tame it. And, and I, is the Bible right or wrong? Is that verse inspired? Is that true? It's there in the Bible. Is it true? Is it accurate? Can we believe it? Was James off his rocker? Or is this, the tongue can no man tame? And you're asking me to tame my own tongue. How can you ask me that? The tongue can no man tame. You see where I'm going with this now? The number three thing is this. Uh, put a Holy Spirit bit on it. All right. What does it say there in verse uh, three? Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouths. You ever seen horses ride around? Somebody ri riding a horse or they're pulling a carriage or whatever? Is it just because that horse is so smart that it goes right? No. If you look closely enough, it's got a big bridle on it. they got something through the teeth there, and that horse has already been trained. He understands. If I don't do what he wants me to do, there's going to be bad results. Well, no man can tame it, but the Holy Spirit can. It put a Holy Spirit bit in it. Um, we looked at the verses about in chapter six, in chapter four, that says, "Submit, resist, draw nigh, humble yourself," which means that you're also saying, "God, I cannot do this," but that doesn't mean it cannot be done. It just means that the God of the impossible needs to do it. That the God who can control all of nature will also control me if I humble myself, if I submit myself and put myself under His control and under His authority. Jesus says, you call me Lord, Lord, but you do not the things that I say. A Lord is one who has control over another. So if we're calling Him Lord, that means He needs to have that control. And when we are willing to submit to His control, then we're going to have victory in the area of our tongue. Um, Back to the topic of nitroglycerin. I didn't care much for science, so all this I was basically learning this whenever I did the study in here. There are two more things I want to say about nitroglycerin in closing. Uh, I told you that, that it was a, a Swedish man named Alfred who, uh, who invented it. Uh, workers in Alfred's factories experienced some interesting side effects. Workers would often come in on Monday and begin complaining about headaches that they would have. But then whenever the weekend came and they got off of work, the headaches went away until Monday morning when they came back again and they began experiencing this. Other workers who had chest pain due to, due to conditions like congestive heart failure and what we would now call angina would discover that when they came to work, they actually felt very good. They didn't have any chest pain. But then over the weekend, when they went back home and they were away from work, they began to experience that chest pain again. Well, this doesn't seem to make any sense. But it does whenever you know what one of the side effects was from the nitroglycerin. It would take another hundred years for these observations to be turned into medical progress. Uh, the side effects of nitroglycerin, which were lowering blood pressure, and dilating the blood vessels would be turned eventually into heart medication. And in 1998, the Nobel Prize for Medicine was divided among three men who had discovered a positive use 
for a substance that had done so much destruction and damage in the past. Who knew that nitroglycerin had a positive effect like that? Now, in 1888, Alfred was up in years. He had a brother, uh, Ludwig, who passed away. A French newspaper got wind of this and mistakenly reported that Alfred had died and wrote a scathing obituary of him, being that he was a man who had, who had championed the production of dynamite and of munitions and, and uh, different types of explosives that had taken lots of lives, this obituary called him a merchant of death who became rich by developing new ways to mutilate and kill. Uh, allegedly, he read this obituary of himself, uh, and um, that created a crisis of conscience in him. And he was determined to be remembered for something other than destruction and death. In his final will, he bequeathed the majority of his fortune to charity, namely to a trust that would fund prizes for excellence in science, chemistry, and medicine. Those were three subjects that were very close to his heart as a chemist and an inventor. Uh, this man also spoke six languages, and the fourth prize that he made a part of his trust was for literature. The fifth prize that he established through his trust was toward making progress toward international fraternity, put another way, for world peace. And we know that the name of those prizes collectively are the Nobel Prizes. And the inventor of dynamite is none other than Alfred Nobel. Despite what he had done in his past and how he was remembered for his inventions, his dying wish was that his name be remembered for peace. Friends, you can change the direction of what your life has been in an instant. You can change tonight. Maybe your tongue has been dynamite in the past. Um, but tonight it can be used for peace. What has been used for destructive purposes can now be a healer of hearts. Under the control of the Holy Spirit, the great fire that the tongue kindles can be used for good rather than for bad. Put yourself under His control and see the good that He can bring from your tongue and from your life. Let's close in prayer. Lord, I pray that you would just take this, this uh, devotion, these words about the tongue, and help us to realize that the tongue is very powerful. As a matter of fact, Proverbs says, um, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And so, Lord, we can do a world of good or a world of destruction with our tongues. And I pray that we, by acknowledging that we have a sinful nature and acknowledging that we cannot in ourselves control our tongue, but that the Holy Spirit can, that God can, if we will be submissive to you, not try to do it on our own, but give the Holy Spirit control. Lord, we'll be able to see good things come out of the use of our tongue. Lord, I pray that that be the heart's desire of everyone in this church tonight. Lord, I pray that we would go out of here and glorify you with our tongues and with our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.